Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, and first of all, thank you to Martin and the other organizers for inviting me here to uh, speak this week. It's my first time in India, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, and also, just the lineup of um, talks this week is really, really fascinating. There's a lot of different research areas that I would uh, very much want to learn more about. So, um, okay, so my, most of my work is based around uh, within host infections and trying to help microbiologists develop new treatments for bacterial infections. Um, so I've got a brief introduction to antimicrobial resistance, but very brief because I'm sure this audience know all about it already. Um, and then three maths examples. And one is that, um, about a generic antivirulence drug, and I will talk about what I mean by that um, when it comes to it. Um, and I'm not going to go into much detail about that particular model. I will um, just give you an overview of the results we found from that, which really led into the next two examples, which are two specific examples of potential new treatments for bacterial infections. Um, so all the sections are linked together, um, but if you happen to switch off in the middle of one, um, you can wake up for the next one and it's fine. Like they're, they're, they're linked, but they're distinct from each other. Um, okay, antimicrobial resistance. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, antibiotics are widely used to treat bacterial infections and they generally work either by directly killing bacteria or inhibiting their growth in some way. And we've had them for around 100 years or so. And in general, they are very successful. But as you will all be aware, antimicrobial resistance is a huge problem. Um, not least because it's been a long time since we actually discovered new classes of antibiotic resistance. So antimicrobial resistance has been around for a long time, but in the past we had lots, new, lots of new antibiotics coming onto the market um, regularly that we could use to treat for um, otherwise resistant infections. It's been a long time since we had um, new antibiotics, and now we are seeing high levels of resistance found throughout the world. It's not limited to specific countries or anything like that. And in particular, it's a huge problem in developing countries and low to middle income countries where it's much easier to get your hands on antibiotics over the counter, and I'm sure you're all aware it's a, it's a big problem in India, um, as well as the rest of the world. Um, and uh, the UK government commissioned a study a few years ago which suggests that by 2050, if we don't do anything to tackle antimicrobial resistance, there will be a predicted 10 million deaths annually worldwide attributable to antimicrobial resistance because of the knock-on effect onto other me medical procedures as well, so things like chemotherapy patients who need to have antibiotics to prevent infection. I'm told by somebody who's in the know at the World Health Organization that they want us to stop using this figure, but the figure looks very good in grant applications, so I think you'll see it um, sticking around for a little while yet. Um, okay, so we need new strategies to combat antimicrobial resistance. And one such strategy, so there are lots of people around the world still looking for new classes of antibiotics, trying to make old antibiotics more effective again, um, and that's all very good. Um, but I also work alongside microbiologists who are trying to develop a new type of treatment, which we call antivirulence drugs. So instead of directly killing bacteria, which is what antibiotics do, they are looking at inhibiting the virulence mechanisms of bacteria or the survival mechanisms of bacteria. So you weaken them in some way, you prevent them from being able to cause infection, and that enables the host immune system to clear the infection. Now, because bacteria use a huge range of different mechanisms to actually cause disease, that means we've got a huge range of different mechanisms that we can target with these drugs. And I've put a handful of these um, different mechanisms up on the slide here, um, because there are plenty more than this, but these are ones that people in my group are working on. And the two that I'm going to talk about today are cell adhesion and the ability of cells to form um, persisters, persister cells, and I'll explain what that is when it comes to it. However, there is a big problem associated with these antivirulence drugs in that in the lab they don't work to 100% efficacy yet. Um, so most of the animal model work that's been done on antivirulence compounds shows that they can weaken and attenuate infections, but they can't actually clear bacterial infections yet. So we wanted to answer this from a mathematical point of view in that what, what do you need to do to these antivirulence treatments? Do we need to change the way we're using them? Do we need to change the design of them? What do we need to do to make them more effective? Um, and that led into this first model, which is the one I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to linger on too long because it's a bit, it's quite a generic model. Um, but it was work done by Lucy Turnant, who was an MSc student in my group a few years ago. And she wanted to just answer this from a sort of very simple point of view, saying, okay, so if we've got a, a mathematical model of a bacterial infection that we're treating with antivirulence drugs um, and antibiotics, how can we make it work? And this is on an antibiotic resistant infection or an infection where there are antibiotic-resistant bacteria present. So what we've got in this schematic 
are antibiotic susceptible bacteria here. Antibiotics can kill those susceptible bacteria. They can reproduce to produce more of themselves. And susceptible bacteria can also undergo conjugation to become resistant. There are other ways to become resistant. This is just the one we've included in these simulations that I'm showing today. Antibiotic resistant bacteria can also reproduce, but they tend to have a fitness cost associated with being resistant. So they will re reproduce at a slower rate than the susceptible bacteria, which is why I've got the thinner line here. Antibiotics still have some effect on resistant bacteria, um, but a much reduced effect. So again, the thinner line here than we have over here. Resistant bacteria can revert back to being susceptible, but that's unlikely to happen when there's antibiotic present. And then I've got a vastly oversimplified immune response down here where I've lumped all types of the immune cells into one grouping, which I've called P for phagocytes. Um, and those phagocytes can inhibit, can kill off both susceptible and resistant bacteria at um, what we assume to be equal rates. And then we want to introduce the antivirulence drug down. So that's the A star down here, the antivirulence drug. And what Lucy decided to do was to say, OK, well, there are tons of different mechanisms by which antivirulence drugs could work. Um, let's capture them all in one, um, one mechanism by saying the antivirulence drug boosts the immune response in some way. And I thought at first that's a bit of a naive way to approach things, but actually when we delved into the microbiology studies that look at antivirulence compounds, in most of those studies they also track immune response as well, and what they've shown is the antivirulence drugs do have either a direct or an indirect boost on the immune response. So you get in, enhanced number of immune cells um, or enhanced function of the immune cells at the, um, at the infection site. So actually this does, uh, although it looks a bit oversimplified, it actually does capture a lot, lot of different um, mechanisms. Um, so we use uh, generally just mass action kinetic modeling for, for this type of model. We're assuming things are well mixed. Obviously, there are oversimplifications within there, but it gives us insight into, into the behavior of the model. So we've got equations for antibiotic, antivirulence drug, P for phagocytes, that's our immune response. So we've got the immune response is just modeled by assuming we've got logistic growth into the infection site where the cells are attracted in by both susceptible and resistant bacteria and then equations for susceptible and resistant bacteria here. There's nothing particularly unusual in, in here. Mass action kinetics, logistic growth, and Hill functions for the um, action mechanisms of the drug action. Um, obviously, there's a whole bunch of parameters in here. For this, we took um, values from the literature. Um, they're unlikely to be correct. I will happily admit that. But it gives us qualitative insight um, into the model. And we've made sure that all the parameters that we're using are biologically um, reasonable, at least. The, Two examples that I'll show you later in the next two sections are where we've actually had data to parameterize the model. And I'm also just going to show you, show you some simulations, some time-dependent simulation outputs. We've done a whole bunch of parameter sensitivity analysis on this, on this model as well, um, but I'm not going to go into details of that today. But I will happily talk to people about it if they want to. Um, so we can simulate this. What we're simulating is an infection that is predominantly antibiotic susceptible, but there are a handful of antibiotic resistant bacteria in there initially as well. So this is what happens if we've got no treatment. So really the, only, the interesting lines are the blue lines for susceptible bacteria and we've got resistant bacteria down here. If you don't treat the bacterial infection, the resistant bacteria are likely to die out because of this fitness cost associated with being resistant. If we add antibiotic in, here we're simulating dosing every half a day, the susceptible bacteria die out and the resistant bacteria um, dominate. And the same thing happens if you um, treat with a constant amount of antibiotics, so as if, as if your patient's on a drip. So nothing surprising here. This is just showing what, um, what you expect to see clinically. If we simulate adding in the antivirulence drug instead, then this time the resistant bacteria um, die out, similar to no treatment. But you get this, so we dose in here, you get these um, uh, persistent populations of susceptible bacteria. And the same thing happens if you administer the antivirulence drug um, continuously. So again, this is... Um, just showing us what, what people are seeing in the lab. So you, you have a reduced infection, but you still have bacteria present at your, um, at your infection. So we thought, okay, so the antibiotics seem to be dealing very nicely with the susceptible bacteria. So I should say when I'm talking about resistance here is in terms of antibiotics. We're not looking at resistance to the antivirulence drugs. Um, so the antibiotic clears up the susceptible bacteria very nicely, and the antivirulence drugs seem to deal with the resistant bacteria. Maybe if we chuck the two in together, we'll clear the entire infection, and that's not what we see from the simulation. Okay? So we were hopeful that that would just work straight away, but it didn't. So if you combine the two drugs at the same time, this is with a continuous dose of both, 
then you still end up with a um, persistent resistant population of bacteria. Um, so what Lucy did, she took the model away and played around with it for a while. And what she realized was actually, if you combine the drugs with a time delay, then you can get full clearance of the model. So this simulation is um, administering the antibiotic first and then the anti antivirulence drug after 14.4 hours. And in no way am I trying to say that's an accurate number that you would need to use. Um, it's just to show you the difference. Um, then you do clear both types of bacteria. And the same thing happens the other way around. If you use the antivirulence drug first and then the antibiotic, you can clear the infection. And we think this is to do with the interplay with the immune system. So if you, if you whack too much of the drug, both drugs in at the same time initially, then you deal with a lot of bacteria, your immune system, your immune response drops um, a little bit too much. Um, and then your immune, response, your immune cells, which are the only ones that are really capable of dealing with the resistant bacteria fully, um, isn't strong enough to clear the, clear the infection. So actually taking into account the immune response is going to be um, very important. So we can get complete elimination of a resistant infection if we choose the right treatment strategy. Model prediction, I'm not saying that that's in reality, so that's what our, our model suggests. Um, but that correct treatment strategy is going to be very dependent on what treatment we're actually using, what the infection is, what the patient's like, and all of that. So the next step, obviously, is to extend the model to be um, bacteria or treatment specific. So we use this as preliminary evidence to get um, a research grant out of the BBSRC, so that's one of the UK Research Councils for Biology, um, to fund us to look at a couple of specific antivirulence treatments. And for both of these, we're looking at the bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a um, pathogenic gram-negative nosocomial infection, so it's hospital-associated. Um, and it's particularly dangerous for immunocompromised patients um, and patients with burn wounds. Burn wounds are very often colonized by Pseudomonas, and we'll see that in the next example. And we do see multi-antibiotic resistant strains of Pseudomonas around the world. And all of this has led to the World Health Organization making this um, one of their priority pathogens at critical level. So, the first real antivirulence um, target we looked at uh, is targeting adhesion. And this is work done in collaboration with Anne-Marie Crackler, who is a biochemist microbiologist over at the medical school um, at the University of Texas. Um, and a lot of her research um, stems around this MAM7 protein. What Anne-Marie found was that this MAM7 protein is found on the surface of lots of different bacteria, including Pseudomonas. Um, and what she showed was that that MAM7 protein is responsible for initiating binding of the Pseudomonas cells to your host cells. And that is the key first step in infection processes. So bacteria need to bind to your cells to be able to infect your cells. So what Anne-Marie's done is develop these, um, or and her group, not just Anne-Marie in isolation, um, they've developed these microbeads and coated them in synthetically produced MAM7 proteins. So the idea is, say you have an open wound, which is prone to be infected, if you can chuck these beads on the wound, those beads will stick to your cells and they will block off all the space where there would have been space otherwise for the bacteria to get in. So it's a bit like if you've got a big car park and you want to keep the bad cars out, if you fill the car park with good, good cars, there's no room for the bad cars to get in. So that's, that's the principle. And they've tested this in um, animal models, and it is, it, has, it is effective, but not fully effective. So the animal model that they use is um, they have rats. It's a burn wound on a rat, so they burn the back of a rat, um, and then infect the burn wound with um, Pseudomonas. Um, and then they can monitor the number of bacteria at that infection site using bioluminescence over seven days. So the top row is our control experiment where they've been infected with the bacteria. You can see the infection really establishing and taking hold um, after a week. The bottom line, the um, wound has been treated with these MAM7 beads. And you can still that you see there are still some bacteria present but the um, infection has not been cleared. So it's not quite good enough at present. So they've obviously repeated um, the rat experiments and you can see all the data here collated. Um, the blue line is the, uh, the control experiments where there's no treatment and we've got the shaded area is the standard area of the mean. And then the green line is the MAM7 treatment case. Um, so there are two key questions here. Firstly, what happens beyond seven days because of the way the animal license works, we have to cull the rats after seven days, so we can't monitor them for any longer than seven days. So we don't know if the treatment will get more effective, less effective, or just stay the same after seven days. 
Um, and then how can we actually improve the treatment so that it's more effective within the seven day um, time period? So we want to use a mathematical model to try and answer these questions. Um, so our postdoc working on this project was Paul Roberts, who was at Birmingham but has since moved to Reading to start on a new postdoc there. This is his um, schematic. Uh, you can tell it's his because it's much prettier than the ones that I produce. Um, so what we have are the skin cells down here and then the exudate, which is like the, the sloppy liquid that you get on the top of a burn wound. And you have bacteria entering the exudate and they can um, grow and divide in the exudate. They can also bind or unbind from the epithelial cells. They can grow and divide down here as well. We've got neutrophils coming into the, um, coming in to uh, tackle the bound bacteria. We know that in this case we've got, um, because of, as a result of actually burning the rats, we get um, a massive in influx of neutrophils. So it's kind of swamped with neutrophils. And so in this particular model, we don't actually track change in numbers of neutrophils. We just assume that they're there in abundance. And then we have MAM7Bs combined or unbind from the surface to block off a space where a bacteria might have otherwise bound. So again, we've got a mass action kinetic model. We've got the, we're tracking the numbers of free bacteria, bound bacteria, free MAM7Bs and bound MAM7Bs. Mass action kinetics, logistic growth, nothing particularly um, interesting in here. Um, well, unusual, I should say, rather than interesting. Um, again, lots of different parameters, some of which we know from the experimental set out, such as like the initial bacteria that we're putting in. Others we take from experimental data, of which we don't have very much. We haven't got more than the, uh, the graph that I showed you earlier. So Paul tried to use um, MCMC methods to fit the parameters to the model, but we didn't get very good convergence um, because of the lack of um, data points. So we really used MCMC to explore parameter space and then honed in on different areas using more classical frequentist um, methods. So we've got our model fit here um, is, the, is the black line, and we've got the no treatment case and the MAM7 treatment case. They look like they're the same, but we've got different axes up here. Um, and we get a sort of acceptable fit. It's not perfect by, by any means, but it, but it looks quite nice. So the first question we wanted to address was what happens beyond seven days? So from the model, we can unpick each individual variable and try and predict what happens. So the only thing that we're really interested in is the blue, the blue and the black line. So the blue line is the number of bound bacteria and the black line is the number of free bacteria. In the no treatment case beyond seven days, um, you get this mixed population of bound and free bacteria. If we treat with MAM7Bs, the bound bacteria disappear, which is what we would expect to see. That's the whole point of the um, anti-adhesion treatment. And being left only with free bacteria is a very nice situation to be in because another method that is used to treat um, burn wounds is this thing called debridement, which is basically washing the wound, or sometimes they use the sort of mini hoover thing to suck up all the, um, all the exudate. And we can incorporate that process into our model. That debridement will deal with any, any of the three molecules um, in the exudate, we'll clear those away. So this is the simulation, we've got lots of different combinations of MAM7 and debridement. So the top black line is the no treatment case, the red line is the MAM7 treatment case, and then the other colours are just different combinations of uh, how often you debride, how often you use the MAM7 treatment. And you can see that the model predicts that we can clear the infection very quickly if we combine MAM7 treatment with debridement. So there's a big but coming up, which some of you probably will have realized already, um, in that there's no unique parameterization for our model. There is nowhere near enough data points. We're not measuring enough things to actually be able to uniquely identify um, our parameter set. So here we've got a completely different set of parameters uh, fitting the model, in this case better, in this case slightly worse, but there's no way of really distinguishing between the two and saying one, we, we, one is definitely correct and the other is definitely wrong. And so Paul was very, very diligent and explored a huge range of parameter space and it, it picked out lots of different, many, many, many different parameter sets that were plausible. But then when we sat down and looked at them in detail, we could split them into four different qualitative um, cases, um, each of which give different long-term predictions. So case A is the case that I've already showed you. Um, in case B, the MAM7 treatment um, starts to become more effective in the very long term. In case C, the MAM7 treatment actually makes, treat, uh, actually makes the bacterial load worse. And in case D, it looks very, um, very similar, so it has very little effect in the long term. So each of these, so the seven day time period that um, our data captures is just this little bit 
here very, very early on. Okay, so very, very early on, these parameter sets all do the same thing. In the long term, they do completely different things. Now, we are hoping to get more experimental data so that we can um, refine which parameter regime we're actually in. But in the meantime, um, we're just going to explore all of these four different cases um, and see what happens. And I think there's actually there's quite a lot of validity in doing that because just because, this, just because this particular strain of bacteria and that particular host works within one of these regimes, it doesn't mean that um, a different host and a different bacteria wouldn't work within one of the other regimes. So um, I think it's increasingly important to actually um, look beyond one um, unique parameter distribution or fitting. Okay. So this is what happens in the long term. What we want to answer is, can we make any of these treatments more effective in the short term? So again, we can simulate combining MAM7 treatment with debridement. So the reason we get these big oscillations here, I don't know if you can see that they're oscillations, is because you're debriding, and then in the next 24-hour period, um, the bacteria have a chance to repopulate the, the exudate. So the bacterial load shoots up and down uh, each time that you debride. So case A is the one that we looked at before. That's the nice, effective treatment case. Um, case B, uh, there is one treatment combination where you can lower the bacterial load but not, um, not clear it. And in cases C and D, it's a bit rubbish. We don't get, it's not, the treatment's not effective at all in the long term. So in some cases, we can combine with debridement to make it work. In other cases, we need to look at changing the um, design of the drug. So there's one thing that we can do to these beads. Um, and that is to make them stickier. So we can coat them in more protein so that they stay bound to your cells for longer. And if we simulate doing that, so that just isn't effect as a um, slight tweak to one of the parameters, um, then I'm, I'm only showing you case D here because that's the worst case scenario, then there are combinations of MAM7 treatment and debridement which will clear the bacterial infection. So there's hope that even if we are in one of these slightly more rubbish parameter regimes, um, then we might be able to change the design of the drug to make it more effective. There's a slight caveat in that, in that at present, the stickiness level of the beads um, doesn't interfere with any host processes. So it doesn't interfere with wound healing. Um, all the things like that work very nicely alongside the beads. If we make them stickier, then we might start to interfere with host um, responses. So it might not be um, biologically realistic that we can um, actually make the beads stickier. So if we can't do that, what else can we do? We can combine with antibiotics, okay? So the idea is we're trying to develop drugs that might um, replace antibiotics is the idea behind antivirulence drugs. But I think more, the more work I do on this, the more I think they're gonna be used probably in combination with antibiotics. So if we were, if we were to simulate treating an antibiotic susceptible, bacteria, susceptible infection using a combination of MAM7 treatment and MAM7 beads and um, antibiotics, it would just work because the bacteria are susceptible to antibiotics. So what we're going to look at instead is treating, with a, is treating an antibiotic resistant infection. So we've got a mixed population of susceptible and resistant bacteria. Again, the resistance refers to antibiotics. Um, so we get extra variables. I won't show you the equations. They just look very similar to the, to the ones before. We get a whole bunch of extra equations that we can simulate um, with a few extra parameters, some of which we've um, estimated from in vitro data, such as the fitness cost of being resistant. So these are our four parameter regimes again. Now this time all the different lines, there's quite a lot on here, but all the different lines represent different combinations of MAM7, debridement, and antibiotic. And in each case now, there are combinations where we can clear the infection. So there is hope um, that we can combine antibiotics with MAM7, with MAM7 beads to, to clear bacterial infections. What we want to look at is actually optimizing that treatment. Can we reduce the amount of antibiotic we need to use? Um, how often do we need to debride? How often do we need to um, apply dosages of the, of the MAM7 beads? So to look at this, we try to restrict ourselves down into a sort of more clinically relevant regime. Um, in all cases, it was a continuous level, like a drip of antibiotics that was most effective. So we're going to um, stick to having a drip of antibiotics. We're going to assume that you can debride at most once a day, but you don't have to debride every day. And there's a maximum amount of um, MAM7 beads that you can use over a, um, over a, a, over a week and we split that up into equal dosages, and you can use multiple doses, doses a day, and again, you don't need to dose a day. And if you take all of those possible combinations, we've got about 14,000 different possible combinations that we need to test, uh, which is a lot of different combinations, but on a computer, that's, that's fine. So we chucked all of those different combinations into a computer, 
picked out which ones turned out to be best for each of the four different parameter regimes and kept our fingers crossed that we would get the same thing coming out for all the different parameter regimes, which roughly we did. So just to summarize what we, what we found, um, largely antibiotics and anti-adhesion beads, the MAM7 beads, they combine synergistically. So actually if you put the two together, their whole is greater than the, than the sum of their parts. So you actually get a much more um, effective treatment than you would with either in isolation or than you might anticipate just by using the two separately, uh, two at the same time. Um, and then there's two cases to consider. So either we want to prevent infection or we want to treat an infection. If we're preventing an infection, then the pattern that came out was that you should use all of your beads initially, the maximum possible dose, and then debride daily. Whereas if you want to clear an infection, then generally you want to use all of your beads initially and then delay debridement for as long as you can because you need to give the beads time to, to settle and really bind and start to dislocate the bacteria from, from the infection. And in some of the parameter cases, actually it's suggested don't debride at all. You need to just um, leave debridement in those, in those cases and debridement could actually make it worse because you're scooping out the beads at the same time as scooping out the bacteria. So this was the general pattern that came out regardless of which parameter set we were in. Um, and what was clear was actually you can significantly reduce the amount of antibiotics you might need to, uh, you might have otherwise used on those infections. So even though we might not be replacing antibiotic, we might be reducing the amount of antibiotic that you would be using otherwise. And reducing antibiotic may hopefully mean antibiotic resistance is less likely to emerge. Okay, so just to summarize this section and then I'll talk about the last case study. So this particular treatment would work by preventing bacteria from binding to host cells. Um, and our model predicts that we can combine it with debridement or change the design of the bead to improve its efficacy. But for full clearance, we would probably need to combine it with um, antibiotics, but that does work on an antibiotic resistant infection. Um, and we are awaiting experimental testing from our um, collaborators over in Texas to see if they can, um, A, test some of our um, treatment predictions, but also B, actually work out which parameter regime we, we actually are in. Okay, so the last example is about targeting changes in cell morphology um, and the ability of pseudomonas to form what's sometimes called persister cells. So this was worked by um, Chloe Spaulding, who was uh, actually my first ever PhD student and she's graduating next week, so I'm very happy about that. Um, uh, yeah, work done by Chloe and her PhD was actually supposed to be on something completely different, but she came across this paper by Monaghan et al, um, which is a group in Australia, uh, in Cynthia Whitchurch's group, although I think she's just moved to the UK. Um, about Pseudomonas and its response to um, changes, uh, response to the presence of certain types of antibiotics. So generally, Pseudomonas takes this rod-shaped form, and you can see it divided into two daughter cells here. If you expose it to certain types of antibiotics, and it's meropenem in this case, um, some, of these, some of the Pseudomonas will die because meropenem works um, relatively effectively on Pseudomonas, but some of the cells will form these spheres. And what they're doing is shedding some aspects of their cell wall which loses their sort of structural integrity, so they go from rods into spheres. But that aspect of the cell wall that they've lost was also the target for the antibiotic. So the antibiotic no longer works on the cells once they form these spherical shapes. The spheres are dormant, they don't divide. All they do is sit there and wait for the bacteria, to, uh, wait for the antibiotic to, to disappear. Once the antibiotic is removed from their environment, they can revert back into this rod-shaped form where they can grow and divide and become toxic again. So some people um, refer to these as persister cells. Um, some people don't like to call them persister So persister cells are genetically identical cells that display resistance, inherent resistance to antibiotics. Um, I'm not quite sure why some people don't like calling them persister cells. I think it's partly because these spherical cells, because of this aspect of the cell wall that they've shed, the spherical cells are quite weak, so they're prone to actually just dying and lysing naturally. Um, and I think that's probably the difference here between what these cells are doing and, and technically persister cells. Um, but either way, it's, it's a way to hide from the antibiotic and survive in the presence of antibiotic. So Chloe made a model of this, so a um, very simple model again. So we've got rod-shaped bacteria that can grow and divide in the presence of nutrients. If you add antibiotic into the system, some of them will die, and a lot of them will die, but some of them will form these um, spherical cells, which also have a natural tendency to, to die without antibiotic, but the antibiotic can't kill the, the spherical cells. And if you remove the antibiotic, the spherical cells can revert back to being rod-shaped. So we've got a mass action kinetic model again with some nonlinear terms for, for saturation and some of the processes that we needed to, to include to make the um, model behave realistically. 
To parameterize this model, um, we had Emma Keane was a technician in our group, um, generating lots of growth and kill curves for us. So we've got an example of one of the growth curves here. The measurements are taken in terms of OD so that we can get higher frequency. Um, and that also captures mixed um, total numbers of rods and spheres added together, which adds a little bit of um, difficulty into parameter identifiability. And um, so we've got an underlying model fit, um, which logistic growth. Um, we're not capturing the lag phase down here, but I'm not particularly worried about that. We could introduce a parameter to capture that lag phase, but I think that would just be um, for the sake of parameterization. We're not particularly interested in it down there. And then we've got kill curves at lots of different concentrations of um, meropenem, the antibiotic, um, up to concentrations that are way higher than the MIC of meropenem and pseudomonas. So you can see the, um, the data is in red. And then if you've got good eyesight, underneath here, you'll be able to see that there are actually two lines. We've got a blue line and a green line, which are two different parameter fittings to this model. So again, we've got identifiability issues. And the difference between the two parameter sets that I'm showing here is simply in the antibiotic sink term, so the rate that we're losing antibiotic from the system. And it's not surprising that we can't identify these parameters because we're not tracking antibiotic concentration. All we know is the amount that we put in initially. We don't know how much is left at the end. And this gives us different long-term predictions at low antibiotic concentrations. At high antibiotic concentrations, it makes no difference, but at low antibiotic concentrations, we get different um, long-term outputs. So this is um, parameter set one, theta one. Um, Long-term prediction is that the bacteria will die out um, because the antibiotic sticks around in the system for longer. Parameter set two, long-term predictions are that you get regrowth of the bacteria because the antibiotic is lost from the system eventually. And we don't know which of these two regimes we're actually in. So we asked Emma to make us some more growth and kill curves to see if we could work out what was going on. And um, this is another growth curve. Again, it fits OK. Um, and then we've got kill curves at different concentrations of the antibiotic to, to the ones that we used earlier. So I don't think you can tell from these which parameters that we're, we're actually in. I think if you eyeball it, the blue line tends to look a bit better. At high concentrations, as we would expect, there's, there's no difference between the two. It's only this low concentration rate. And parameter set one, which is the blue line, looks slightly better, but if you look at the error, uh, errors between the data and the model, you can't really decide which is, um, which is better. So we, we were quite happy. We just thought, well, we'll just do all of our investigations um, on both parameter sets, as we tend to do in my group, um, and sent it off to um, try and get it published. Um, and when we did that, one of the reviewers very wisely pointed out that we weren't actually using all the data that we, that we had. So we had taken some of our own microscopy images to show um, this transition between rods and So here we've added antibiotics. After one hour, everything is still predominantly rod-shaped. After six hours, you see these spheres emerging. And then after 22 hours, you can't really see it on these slides very well, but there are some spheres remaining, but you can see them transitioning back to, to rod shape. Um, and we hadn't used this for parameterization because the experimental setup is entirely different to take the microscopy images. Um, and I'll be honest, when the reviewer suggested, I thought, yes, that is a good suggestion, but my heart sank a little bit because I thought there is no way our model is going to fit this um, uh, very nicely. But they suggested saying, OK, so your experimental setup is different. Why don't you just track the proportions of rods and spheres over time and see if your model matches up? And maybe one of your parameter sets will be better than the other. This is my favorite plot ever because you get perfect agreement between the model and the, uh, and the data. Because if you add no antibiotic to your system at all, um, both the model and the data tell us, tells us that you have um, a, a population that is entirely rod shaped and you get no spherical cells at all at any time point, which is what you would expect to see. At 0.5 micrograms per mil of meropenem, parameter set two, which is the one that actually looked worse before, captures the data really extremely nicely um, in both cases. Um, it almost goes through the error bars, not quite, um, in the last data point. And parameter set one, the blue line, qualitatively is doing the right thing, but quantitatively is getting it, um, getting it wrong. Things can't stay this good forever. So at two micrograms per mil, which was the only other set of data that we had, this time parameter set two, the green line, is uh, qualitatively doing the right thing, but not quite, not capturing the right time point here. And parameter set one, which is the one that we thought was better before, is way off. It's not even qualitative, qualitatively doing the right thing. And what we think is happening here, so what's going on is that the, you start off with almost entirely rod-shaped cells, then some of your cells transition to spheres, and then the population returns back to being fully rod-shaped. This isn't taking into account numbers, but proportions of cells. And we think when we're taking the microscopy images, 
the, um, when we're plating the cells um, for the image, image taken, we're probably unnaturally popping some of those spherical cells because they are much more fragile, they're weaker than the other cells. So we think when we're plating them, we're probably losing some of the spherical cells um, that would have otherwise been present. So the microscopy images are sort of artificially making the population return back to being rod shaped um, slightly too early. And that's why our model's not picking that up. At least that's our, that's our explanation for, for what's going on. Either way, we continued with both parameter sets anyway, because I think it's um, more informative to, to work with both. But it was nice to see that actually, even with an entirely different experimental setup, the model still works very nicely. Um, okay, so that's all we've done so far with this model is show that we can replicate what goes on um, in the lab. What we really want to do is, can we exploit this ability of the cells to form persistence, to form these spherical cells um, to develop new treatments? And what that original paper, Monaghan et al, had done was use antimicrobial peptides to um, kill the spheres. So because they're weaker, you can put these peptides on the spheres and those peptides will kill the, kill the spheres. And they showed in the lab that that's possible and that does work. So we can simulate that by increasing the, death, the natural death rate of the um, spherical cells. So by increasing the death rate, we're moving from the red line down to the purple line here. The red line is our default um, uh, parameter set. Um, so at low antibiotic concentrations, where our model predicts that the um, treatment wouldn't be effective, um, if you add in antimicrobial peptides, our model suggests that actually there are, if you put in enough of them, you will be able to clear the entire um, population. So these, the, remember the OD is the spheres plus the rods. At high antibiotic concentrations, where the model predicts that you would in the long term be able to clear the bacteria away, adding in antimicrobial peptides should clear the infection more quickly. So in vitro and in silico, this looks very good. So we thought, okay, that's all well and good, but that's all at the in vitro level. We want to say, what would happen if you actually put this inside someone's body? So we've got no data for this, but we thought we'll theoretically incorporate an immune response into the infection to try and make this a bit more realistic. Um, again, just a very, very simple, oversimplified um, representation of an immune response. We've just got one type of cell, and there are two rates associated with it. One is the rate of recruitment, so the rate at which those immune cells are attracted into the infection site, and then the second rate is the phagocytosis rate. And those rates might differ depending on if you're looking at the rods or at the spheres. It might be faster for one, slower for another. And Chloe looked at all the different combinations, and I'm just going to present one example um, today, because I think it's the one that comes out with the most interesting results, which is that we're going to assume that the immune cell recruitment rate is the same regardless as if the bacteria are rods or if they are spheres, um, but that the phagocytosis rate is lower for spheres, which actually I thought initially was probably the wrong way round, because you have this idea that this, the spheres are quite fragile, um, you would expect the um, immune cells to be able to deal with them quite easily. But talking to the microbiologists, they think because of the changes in the cell wall, actually the immune cells might struggle to deal with the, deal with the spheres um, more than they would with the rods. And also, I'm jumping right to the very end of Chloe's PhD here, I'm going to incorporate re antibiotic resistant bacteria in here as well so that we can look at the most complex um, set of results. So to summarize this in a schematic, we, can, we have rod shaped um, susceptible cells that can be killed by antibiotic. In the presence of anti antibiotic, they might tra transition into spherical cells, uh, which can hide from the antibiotic, um, and the spherical cells can also transition back into being rods. Then we have immune cells that are attracted in at equal rates by the rods and the spheres, but the immune cells will deal with the rods more, more efficiently than they deal with the spheres. They still have an effect on the spheres, but just a much slower one. And then we've got a mirror image of that for um, and, or a near, near mirror image of that for antibiotic, antibiotic resistant versions of all of these different bacteria, except for the fact that antibiotic um, struggles to deal with the antibiotic resistant rods. Mass action kinetic model, again, drawing all the, on all the parameters that we used previously in the parameter surveys that we did. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to show you two simulations um, from this. And the first is add in um, antibi antibiotics and antimicrobial peptides. So the idea is the antibiotics will deal with the rods, the antimicrobial peptides will deal with the spheres, and we should be able to clear the whole infection. So this is what happens if you just put antibiotics in alone. Um, most of the population uh, dies out. So these are the four different types of bacteria that you can get, but you get a persistent population of antibiotic-resistant spheres. 
if we simulate adding in the antimicrobial peptides, actually you get quite a counterintuitive result. So the resistance spheres then drop down to very low levels, but you get a sharp rise in the number of antibiotic-resistant rods in the infection. And again, as with the very first example I showed you, this is because of the interplay with the immune system. So if you're dropping the number of, um, lowering the number of spheres, you get a slightly lower um, immune response because there are fewer foreign bodies in there for the immune response to actually tackle. Um, and the immune cells are the only ones that can deal with these antibiotic resistant rods. So you're dropping the numbers of the only weapon that we've got against the resistant rods. And these are the worst type of bacteria that we've got here because they're antibiotic resistant. They are growing and dividing and they will be actively attacking host. So actually, once you incorporate in the immune response, um, antimicrobial peptides might not be a very good way to go at all. And so one thing I would very much like to learn about more about this week is actually much more detailed models of the immune, system, immune response. So I know that I, we have a massively oversimplified um, model of the immune system in here. So understanding what differences we would get out of the model if we actually introduced more complexity um, would be very interesting for me. So the last simulation to show you is actually if we go back to the idea of a generic antivirulence drug where we're boosting the immune response in some way, either directly or indirectly, um, then what would happen? So this is the antibiotic alone simulation. This is the same as you saw before. This time, if we just boost the immune response, and we say that the antivirulence drug works by boosting the immune response against the rods, they still struggle to tackle the spheres, um, then the simulation suggests that actually you can clear the, um, the bacterial infection by using antivirulence drugs instead of antimicrobial peptides. So to summarize this section, um, Pseudomonas changes its cell structure in response to certain antibiotics and antimicrobial peptides, although they look good in the lab, they might actually be quite a risky strategy to go for um, in vivo. Um, but I think understanding the immune response is going to be really crucial and I think that's something that a lot of us from the sort of within host bacterial community um, have a tendency to, to neglect quite often. Um, and I think making real progress in this is going to have detailed models of bacterial infections combined with detailed models of, of the immune response. Okay, so overall, I think there is potential to develop alternatives to antibiotics or adjuvants to antibiotics to make them more um, effective, but the predictions are not always as intuitive as you might um, expect. Um, and com I think the way we're going to have to go forward with these, with most of them, is by using them in combination with other treatments. Um, and by doing it in combination even with antibiotics, we might be able to minimise the amount of antibiotics that we're using to treat infections. But the exact treatment strategies that you're going to need um, will vary depending on which patient you're looking at, which type of bacteria you're looking at, which infection you're looking at, and which type of antivirulence treatment you're actually looking at. So computational modelling, I think, is really going to help with designing these kind of personalised treatment strategies. Um, and that's everything. Thank you very much for listening.